Hi, and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Lisa Stack, and I'm the support coordinator here at CNY Fertility Center. Uh, my role is to offer emotional peer support to our clients. Um, I facilitate the Syracuse Circle of Hope support group and our Facebook uh, private support groups as well. And I facilitate a few webinars and teleworkshops throughout the month, giving you an opportunity to connect with our center and receive some more information, some more emotional support, and give you the opportunity to really check in with us. Um, let us know what we can help you with, maybe if you're having any challenges um, that we aren't able to address specifically during your appointments, you can always bring them to me. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always email me directly at lstack, S-T-A-C-K, at cnyfertility.com, or you can message me within your patient portal, again, under Lisa, Lisa Stack. Um, tonight, we have a great guest, and we are going to be hearing about the legal aspects of surrogacy and gestational carrier cycles. Um, so I'm going to turn it over tonight to Efat, and she's going to share us her expertise. And um, if you have any questions about the session, we will absolutely make her email address available to you so you can connect with her directly. And if you have any questions about the ins and outs of how we facilitate um, donor cycles and any cycle that really would come under the umbrella of surrogacy and gestational carrier cycles, you can always contact your donor team at um, our office at any time, and we'd be happy to set up a free phone consult for you. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, and Ifat, you can jump right in. Thank you, Lisa, and hello, everyone. My name is Ifat Shaltiel, and I first want to start by thanking everyone for joining us today to talk about a topic that I'm very passionate about, surrogacy and egg donation. I first would like to tell you a little bit about myself. I have been an attorney for over 10 years. I graduated from New York Law School and I'm admitted to practice law in the states of New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Our law firm is Sheltia Law Group and I specialize in reproductive technology law, adoption law, and estate planning. I also, want, I also own and manage Surrogate Steps, which is a surrogacy program where we match intended parents with the right surrogate to build their family, and we assist and coordinate the surrogacy journey from beginning to end. We strongly believe in a team approach, and so we work together with a team of specialists, including psychologists and social workers, to guide intended parents every step of the way so that they have the best possible surrogacy experience. And personally, I came to specialize in this area through my personal family building journey. I realized that the journey to parenthood for many involved infertility, including gamma donation, where uh, whether it is sperm, egg, or embryo donation, and as well it can involve surrogacy. And so I became very passionate about reproductive technology law and surrogacy. And I am blessed to have two beautiful children. I am very grateful to also be working in this area and direct a surrogacy program where we help people achieve their dreams every day of having children and building their families. As a brief overview, here is what we will be discussing today. First, we will review some important terminology that you should familiarize yourself with. We will review the surrogacy process, cost of surrogacy, and important topics to discuss with your surrogate that will also be covered in your surrogacy contract. We will also review ovum donation, also known as egg donation, the cost of ovum donation, and important topics to discuss with your donor that will also be covered in your ovum donor agreement. And finally, we will leave some time for questions. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation and may be submitted anytime to me by email. My email address is ys at surrogatesteps.com. So let's start with terminology. 
Uh, when you are looking to become a parent through surrogacy, there are certain terminology, some medical, some legal, that is important to be familiar with. You will note that on the slide I have included for you abbreviations for each terminology, and that is because you may find that your doctors, your nurses, and lawyers may use these abbreviations and um, I, I know as a lawyer, we use them on a daily basis um, in this line of work. Uh, so we have artificial insemination. This is the deliberate introduction of semen into the female's oviduct for purposes of achieving a pregnancy. So for example, if a traditional surrogate is used, this method may be used to place a sperm or donor, or donor sperm in her oviduct. Art, assisted reproductive technology, basically any means of using assisted reproductive technology to build a family, such as IVF, ICSI, surrogacy, egg donation, sperm donation, or embryo donation. HCG is an injectable medication that essentially causes a woman to ovulate, typically within 36 hours of when a woman takes the HCG, her eggs are released into the uterus. Intracervical insemination. This is insemination of what is referred to as raw semen into the woman's cervix by injecting it with a needless syringe. So for example, this is different from IUI, which is also there um, on the slide, intrauterine insemination which is washed semen that is placed directly into the woman's uterus. Uh, and if a sperm is placed directly into the woman's uterus, it must be washed to remove what is called spermatosa, which contains, um, which is contained on the raw semen. If raw sperm is placed in the woman's cervix, then the woman's body will naturally clean the sperm and remove this chemical, which could be harmful to the woman. However, if doctors are artificially inseminating the semen into the woman's uterus, then they will have to wash and clean the sperm before the insemination. ICSI is an amazing procedure where the embryologist in the lab will take an egg and inject a sperm into that egg using a special syringe causing fertilization. From that point on, as soon as the egg is fertilized and has more than one cell, it is called an embryo. IUI, as we just covered, IVF is a process where the embryologist takes an egg and semen and places them in a petri dish and waits for the eggs to be fertilized. Reproductive endocrinologists, of course, are, are amazing doctors. It is a subspecialty of obstetrics and gynecology that specializes in infertility and reproductive medicine. And these are some of the legal terminology that is used. Intended father, intended mother, intended parents. Of course, these are the intended parents seeking to become parents through art. Egg donor, which is also referred to as ovum donor. Gestational carrier, also referred to as gestational surrogate, depending on the state that you are in. Sperm donor, and traditional surrogacy or traditional surrogate. So what is a surrogate? A surrogate is a woman who agrees to become pregnant through assisted reproductive technology and carries a child for the intended parents. And there are two types of surrogacy arrangements, traditional surrogacy and gestational surrogacy. Traditional surrogacy involves a surrogate who agrees to carry the child for another couple using her own eggs. In this type of an arrangement, the surrogate is inseminated typically through artificial insemination or IUI. And you can imagine that traditional surrogacy arrangements can be complicated because of the biological bond between the surrogate and the child since the child born is actually genetically related to the surrogate. So it is much riskier both emotionally and legally. And emotionally because the woman may have difficult time giving up the baby that she is genetically related to. 
and legally it can be complicated because most states will require that a traditional surrogate must relinquish her rights before issuing a parentage order to the intended parents. And because the child will not be related to the intended mother, the intended mother may have to adopt her own child under this arrangement. In contrast, a gestational surrogate, as we said also referred to as a gestational carrier, is a woman who agrees to become pregnant for the intended parents by means of assisted reproductive technology, where the eggs of the intended mother or an egg donor will be used. So the gestational carrier is not genetically related to the conceived child. And a surrogate may be compensated or compassionate. Compassionate surrogates are surrogates who agree to carry a child for the intended parents without taking any fees for her pain and suffering. Some states like New York only allow compassionate surrogacy arrangements. The intended parents may reimburse the compassionate surrogate for certain expenses that the surrogate derives as a result of the surrogacy arrangement, but it is important that intended parents consult with a reproductive law attorney to see what expenses are permitted. It is also important to understand that surrogates who are compensated are being compensated for their pain and suffering and for the risk that they undertake in becoming pregnant and carrying a child. It is very important that everyone understands that no one is buying a baby. So the surrogate is only being compensated for the risk that she's taking for herself and her pain and her suffering. Of course, I always get the question of how much does a surrogate cost? Surrogate's compensation can range anywhere between $20,000 to $30,000 and can be higher. The race will also depend on the qualities of the surrogate, her age, for example, and whether she has been a surrogate before. And in addition to the compensation of the surrogate, there is also the total cost of surrogacy, and the total cost of surrogacy when you have a compensated surrogate can range anywhere between $50,000 to $100,000 and can even be higher. Every state has different laws when it comes to surrogacy. DC, for example, completely prohibits and does not enforce surrogacy contracts. Other states like New York and Michigan do not allow compensated surrogacy arrangements and declare surrogacy contracts void as against public policy. While other states allow surrogacy, such as California, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. But it is very important for our patients to seek the advice of an attorney who specializes in this field. For example, I have to know the different laws that apply in different states and even from county to county and different judges because the law sometimes even differs within the state from county to county and even differs sometimes um, between the judges. Generally, when it comes to state law, in terms of which law will apply, we will be looking to see where is the nexus of the case. Where does the surrogate reside, for example? Where will the child be born? Generally speaking, the state where the surrogate resides will typically be the applicable state law. So as you can imagine, legal planning is crucial in these types of art arrangements. Surrogacy requires legal planning before intended parents even start looking at a surrogate. It is important for intended parents to know how to protect their parental rights of their future children. And state laws regarding surrogacy, as I stated, do vary from state to state. But even in states where surrogacy is permissible, there is no guarantee that the contract will be enforceable. In some states, the intended parents' parental rights will be protected only if the intended parents are genetically related to the child. Other states may require that intended parents both be married in order to be on the birth certificate. And this would be applicable to same-sex couples just as it would be applicable to heterosexual couples. So one of the first steps in taking this journey is to have an understanding of the state laws and an understanding of 
how your legal rights as parents are going to be protected. We don't want a surrogate or an egg donor to come back after the child is born and try to claim a legal right to that child. So one of the resources that parents need to make sure they have access to is an attorney who specializes in this area to ensure that they are protected. So take New York for example, because it is very risky process in New York, most couples look to more friendly states on this issue, such as Connecticut, Pennsylvania, or Massachusetts. Now, when it comes to compensated gestational surrogates, it's not going to matter whether the intended parents, where it is that the intended parents reside. They can reside in New York, they can live in France. It doesn't matter as long as the gestational surrogate does not reside in New York or does not reside in the non-surrogate friendly state. So we will want to apply the law in the jurisdiction of the surrogate and where the baby will be born. And it is important that the intended parents understand the laws of that state where the surrogate is located because it will impact whether or not they can get a pre-birth order to have their names on the birth certificate as they take the baby home from the hospital and make any medical decisions relating to that baby. So, for example, if the gestational carrier is from Connecticut, the intended parents will be able to get a pre-birth order naming them as parents. However, if the surrogate is a compassionate surrogate in New York, a married couple will be able to get birth order after the surrogate relinquishes her rights and only if they are genetically related to the child. I am happy to say that I have been successful in obtaining custody for intended parents in New York before the child is born, but the surrogate still needs to surrender her parental rights after the birth of the child. And since I know a lot of you today have questions about New York law, I want to briefly also cover New York law. So as we have been discussing, New York is not friendly state for these type of agreements. New York statute does declare that surrogacy contracts are contrary to public policy of the state. And any surrogate contracts that are entered into are void and unenforceable as a matter of public policy. So in New York, agreements to pay compensation to a gestational carrier other than medical expenses are expressly prohibited and there are penalties for those who assist in such formation of the contracts. However, compassionate surrogacy is permissible in New York, but this agreement must be carefully structured with no agreement by the surrogate before the child is born to surrender the child that, um, and of course, she cannot be compensated. So it is important to know that you can have an uncompensated compassionate surrogate in New York State, and if you do decide to have a compassionate surrogate in New York, you still have to plan accordingly and have a legal plan in place to protect your parental rights. And of course, a big part of the legal planning is the finalization process. We want to make sure that at the end of this journey, the intended parents are named on the birth certificate. So again, that's also why jurisdiction is very important because it would be a deal to work with a surrogate in a state that would allow the intended parents to obtain a pre-birth order so that when the child is born, they already have an order in place that they are the legal parents. So we want to use a jurisdiction that is most surrogate friendly and the birth certificate will be issued in the state where the child will, will be born. So who is my mother? Who is the legal mother? So who do you think the law will regard as the legal mother? Is it the intended mother, the traditional surrogate who is using her own egg, or in case of a gestational carrier, the birth mother who carried the child but who is not genetically related to the child, or is it the egg donor? So the answer is, it just depends. It is because it's going to depend on which applicable law will be applying to your case. Take New York, for example, the birth mother will be recognized as the legal mother, regardless of whose eggs are used. She will always be the legal mother until the law is changed, of course, and will have to relinquish her rights after birth. So whether or not the birth mother or gestational surrogate is biologically or genetically related to the child, she will be the legal mother in New York. 
But in other states, take Connecticut, for example, if a gestational carrier is used, the legal mother is the intended mother, regardless if an egg donor was used and if the intended mother herself is genetically related to the child. And you also have to ask in legal planning who is going to be the legal father. That answer is also not as simple as you may think. And again, it will, of course, depend on the jurisdiction that you are in and if the surrogate is married. So, for example, if the gestational carrier is married, even though the intended father used his own sperm and is genetically related to his child, the law may still require that the intended father obtains a birth order and that the surrogate's husband relinquishes his rights. And I just want to review a hypothetical with you. Um, intended parents would like to seek a surrogate mother to carry their child. If intended parents reside in a state that is not a surrogate friendly state, or if they reside in a state that declares surrogacy as against state policy, are the intended parents allowed to participate in a surrogacy activity? So New York does not allow compensated surrogacy and will not enforce a surrogacy contract. But you have to consider where the nexus of your case is going to be. So even if you are intended parents in New York, you can participate in surrogacy activity so long as the surrogate does not reside in the state of New York. So you are able to seek a compensated surrogacy in a surrogacy friendly state. Can the intended parents from a non-surrogacy friendly state compensate the surrogate. New York says you cannot compensate a surrogate. If you're in New York and you have a surrogate outside the state of New York, can you compensate her? If the intended parents are looking to be matched, then they most certainly are looking for surrogates that they must compensate. And so even though you may have intended parents in New York um, that cannot compensate a surrogate in New York, they are allowed to compensate a surrogate who is located in a surrogacy-friendly state where the law would allow them to do so. And again, we always ask which law is going to apply. We're always going to look at the nexus of your case. And as we discussed, typically it is going to be the residential location of the surrogate. And also, uh, we're going to ask, is a contract enforceable? And the answer is, if you are in New York, for example, the contract is not enforceable as a matter of public policy. It's simply not going to be recognized. But even in states that allow surrogacy, no one can guarantee that provisions in that contract will be enforceable. For example, we know that there are certain provisions in the contract that will most definitely not be enforceable. Such provisions, for example, as relating to abortion and pregnancy termination. No court is going to tell a surrogate that she must abort a baby. So for this reason, screening a surrogate is very, very important, and we want to make sure that all of the parties' intentions are placed in the agreement, even terms that are not enforceable, so that everyone knows what to expect and what their responsibilities are. But even though a contract may not be enforceable, or even though not all provisions within that contract may be enforceable, making sure that there is a contract that states the party's intentions is important because it does uh, work as a roadmap for the surrogacy journey. It ensures that everyone's interests are represented and understood, and it is to avoid legal complications in the future. And when it comes to surrogacy contracts, it is very important that both the surrogate and intended parents have legal representation. As we said, the contract between the parties is there to protect the intended parents and foresee future risks. It is used as a guidance of the map of the meeting of the minds between intended parents and the surrogate. So again, each knows and understands what the expectations and intentions are. There are many things that you will want to address in a surrogacy contract. Compensation, for example. How much is a surrogate going to get paid and who will pay her? Typically, surrogates are paid in installments, so we need to address how often she will be paid, when she will receive her 
first payment? Uh, will she be reimbursed separately for other expenses? Will she be compensated more if she's carrying multiples? And will she be paid directly by the intended parents or through an escrow management with your surrogacy program? It is very important that these issues are addressed in the contract so there, there's no question as to how compensation will be paid. One of the most important issues to address is also future contact between the surrogate and the intended parents and the future child. It is important to understand how much future contact does the surrogate expect, if any, with any child that she carries. Will she be respectful of the intended parent's decision if they do not want to have contact with her in the future? Some surrogates will say that they leave any future contact completely up to the intended parents. Others do not want any future contact at all, and yet others do want to receive maybe yearly updates. Um, on the other hand, if the surrogate is a family member or a friend, we want to be sure that we address how the child will know her. Uh, will she be known as aunt? You know, this information and how and what information is, sh is shared with friends and family members is very important. Again, we want to make sure that everyone understands and everyone is on the same page. Health insurance is also very important. Does the surrogate have health insurance? Who will be paying the premiums of her health insurance? And was there a health insurance review uh, conducted to ensure there's no surrogacy exclusion in the surrogate's health insurance plan. In access to medical records, we want to address how involved will the intended parents be in medical appointments, in the delivery room, will they go to prenatal appointments, will the surrogate agree that the intended parents have access to all the medical records during the pregnancy. And one of the most important sections uh, relates to abortion and pregnancy reduction. This language, as we just discussed, would be completely unenforceable in a court of law, but it must be clarified for everyone. So for example, if the parties all agree that the surrogate will undergo an abortion and terminate the pregnancy if the conceived child, for example, has Down syndromes, and during the pregnancy the surrogate changes her mind if no longer wants to have an abortion or terminate the pregnancy, that provision simply won't be enforceable. And again, that is why it is very important from the very beginning to do thorough screening and have these conversations and make sure it is in your contract to make sure that everyone understands um, what the expectations are, what the intentions are, and that everyone is on the same page. We also have the surrogates undergo psychological testing to make sure that they are completely comfortable with any abortion decision that they make. So you can understand why screening of courts is crucial. Uh, we never had any of these issues in our program, but unfortunately we do hear some of these instances. And um, just to give you an example, um, there was a Connecticut couple who hired a surrogate. And in Connecticut, gestational surrogacy is legal. And the surrogate was located in Connecticut. The intended parents um, in Connecticut are able to obtain pre-birth order naming them as legal parents on the birth certificate and allowing them to make any medical decisions in the hospital regarding to the baby. But in that particular case, um, the carrier agreed to have an abortion in case of severe fetus abnormality, but unfortunately the contract was not clear as to exactly what would be included as an abnormality. So long story short, very long story short, um, basically the baby did have severe abnormalities and the intended parents did want to have an abortion and the surrogate refused. And um, the surrogate ended up uh, fleeing to Michigan. In Michigan, the gestational carrier um, was recognized just like in New York, as the legal mother, and since she was a birth mother, as a legal mother, and the gestational carrier contract is not recognized in Michigan. It is also in Michigan against state policy. And what happened was that the gestational carrier did locate adoptive parents, and through a private adoption, um, the baby was adopted. 
the surrogate as the birth mother gave up her parental rights and the intended father also as a genetic and birth father they consent to the adoption as well and they all agreed to keep the adoption open um, but she refused to abort and she did flee to Michigan. So it's a very sad case, but it does demonstrate why it is so important that the contract that the parties sign contains clear language that both parties fully understand um, and that they fully understand what it is that they are citing. I do want to just say and let you all know that it is not common for a surrogate to change her mind to keep a baby and again you want to make sure that you are working with good and reputable surrogacy program and attorneys and that they screen well. For example, some of the screening that should be done is criminal background checks, medical review, psychological exams, um, thorough interviewing, home studies and anyone who would like more information about screening I would welcome you to please contact me and I'd be happy to have a more detailed conversation with you about that. It is very important that the surrogate has health insurance that will cover the surrogacy pregnancy. Prior to 2014 it, it used to be that many surrogates did not have insurance or if they had insurance there would be a surrogacy exclusion. This means that the insurance plan did cover a pregnancy but it did not cover a pregnancy if it was a surrogacy pregnancy. The Affordable Care Act, also referred to as ACA, states that maternity care must be covered by qualified health insurance plans and it specifically classifies maternity care coverage as an essential health benefit that must be covered. However, it does not necessarily mean that every plan offered on the health care exchanges will cover a surrogacy pregnancy and as an insurance review therefore is very important. Also employers who provide insurance including self-insured employers or self-funded plans do not have the same requirements as the plans offered on the exchanges. For example, they do not have to provide essential health benefits. They have other standards and tests that they must meet but essential health benefits is not necessarily one of them. So just because you may think that, let's say for example, your friend has Blue Cross and was told that her plan covers a surrogacy pregnancy, don't think that it must mean that the surrogate's insurance, which might also be through Blue Cross, that it also covers the surrogacy pregnancy. It does not. And we work with clients all the time to review their surrogacy plans to make sure that it covers a surrogacy pregnancy and if it doesn't, then you have to look at other ways to obtain coverage for the surrogacy pregnancy. If your surrogate does not have a health insurance plan that will cover surrogacy pregnancy, you may need to then purchase an insurance plan that will do so. So one option is to purchase surrogacy insurance. These policies typically are very expensive they have a premium of approximately $10,000 and deductibles that can start at $15,000 for a singleton and $30,000 for twins. Another option is to purchase the surrogate a new policy through the Affordable Care Act based insurance exchanges that will cover the surrogacy maternity care. Typically, the health policy premium can range anywhere from $200 to $500. It could be lower or higher depending on the plan that you are purchasing. As you may already know, there are different plan levels including bronze, silver, and gold and the deductible for an individual plan should not exceed $6,350. But you have to make sure that if you are purchasing such a plan, the circuit must apply during open enrollment Typically, open enrollment period is between November 15th and February 15th. Or if she applies during a non-enrollment period, she's going to have to show that she has a qualifying life event in order to do that. And a third option is to purchase backup in surrogacy insurance. This plan allows parents to purchase 
the option of having a service insurance plan in place in case they need it. So the plan will typically cost approximately $3,000 and it provides the intended parents with the option of moving forward with their surrogate's insurance policy, but if for any reason the insurance does not cover the surrogacy pregnancy, then the parents will have the option of using this policy to cover the maternity costs. And the initial fee should be used towards their deductible. If the parents never used uh, this policy, then I do believe that a certain percentage of the fee uh, would be refunded to them. And just to touch base on fertility coverage, 15 states have enacted legislation that require insurance companies to offer fertility treatment coverage. These states include, for example, Arkansas, California, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York. And if anyone would like the full list or has any questions, I do encourage you to contact me and I'd be happy to provide you with that information. But the issue is that self-insured employers, uh, self-insured employer plans are exempt from state mandates. And so they will typically have additional exclusions such as marital and age restrictions. Now, three of these states do require um, insurers to only offer fertility coverage, and it is then up to the individual employers to ask and pay for such coverage. Now, under the ACA, plans offered on the healthcare exchanges will be required to comply with each state's legislation and provide the coverage as mandated by that state. Insurers will also be required to provide fertility coverage in the 15 states that currently mandate such coverage. So there are many things to discuss as it relates to surrogacy, but I do want to also briefly turn to egg donation. So very few states have laws about egg donation. Connecticut, for example, has laws regarding egg donation that indicates that an anonymous egg donor does not have any right to the child conceived from her egg. New York, for example, does not have laws about egg donation. In New York, the birth mother will be recognized as the mother regardless of whose egg is used. She will always be considered the legal mother until obviously the law changes. An egg donor may be known or anonymous. She may be compensated or compassionate. So you can have a known donor who may be a friend or a family member who is known to you and who perhaps has agreed to be an egg donor at no cost, therefore she's a compassionate egg donor. Or the egg donor could be anonymous, perhaps you purchased the ovum through a crime bank or you have been matched through an egg donor agency. And when we are dealing with an ovum donor, just as we would with a surrogate, it is very important to have a contract in place and good screening. It is essential, the contract is essential, it acts as a map of the meeting of the minds, it protects the parties, and fully sets forth the expectations and intentions of the parties. And of course it ensures that there is a full understanding of the process of the egg donation and harvesting of the egg. So when talking to your egg donor and in your contract, there are many provisions that we would want to address. For instance, confidentiality and identity of an anonymous egg donor needs to be protected so that the egg donor does not come back and try to claim legal right to the child and fight the legal presumption that the birth mother is the legal mother. We want to be clear that the egg donor will not be looking to form any parental bond with the future child or seek custody of the donated eggs. Other issues that should be addressed when discussing confidentiality is if the parties would like their information to remain with a third party. While the parties want to be anonymous today, if there are medical issues with a future child, the egg donor may want to make herself available to help that future child, and the parents may want to contact the egg donor for such medical reasons and help. The issue of disposition of embryos is also very important. It is important that the contract outlines what will happen to the embryos that are created from the egg donation. So when we draft the contract, 
we have to keep in mind that there may be unused embryos that result from this process. For example, the parties will all have to agree if parents can give leftover embryos to a third party or donate unused embryos to medical research. The donor, for example, may only agree to donate to one family and will want unused embryos destroyed, or the donor may leave such questions in the complete discretion of the recipient family. It is just important that the parties understand this from the very beginning and that everything is laid out in the contract so that we can ensure that the donor is a good match for this recipient family and, of course, avoid legal issues in the future. Intended parents will also typically sign consent forms with their clinic that will address divorce scenarios, for example. This can become an issue if it is not clearly addressed, and it actually comes up more frequently than you may think. Uh, you want to be sure that it is clear what parents will do with those unused embryos if there is a divorce or perhaps if one of them dies. And just briefly, I want to mention that as intended parents, you should make sure that you have estate planning for your family and future children in place. You want to make sure that your future child is protected in case both parents die, for example, no matter what the art arrangement is, regardless whether both parents are biologically related to the future child or if a donor was used, you want to address in a will who will be the legal guardians of that child, along with other important reproductive law provisions that are applicable to your estate planning. We also want to address health coverage for your donor. Um, you know, intended recipient parents might need to get a temporary health insurance policy for the benefit of the donor, and it is important to understand that the, that donor policy, how it works and what it's going to cover and what it's not going to cover. The egg donor insurance policy is there so that if there is a complication or if something does happen the first three months after the egg retrieval, or even perhaps immediately after the egg retrieval, that the egg donor's medical conditions and expenses are covered. Because it is important to understand that this is not a risk-free process, and the egg donor is taking risk to her health and potential complications in undergoing an egg retrieval, such as ovarian hyperstimulation. So having a policy in place that will cover such medical expenses from complications is very important because it could be costly. And cost, of course, is another important issue that must be discussed uh, and covered in the contract. There are no laws as to how much egg donors can get paid, but the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, ASRM, did establish ethical guidelines regarding this and basically indicated that if the fee is above $5,000, it should require justification and um, it's, they also stated that it should not exceed $10,000 per cycle. The agreement must also define how the donor will be compensated. For example, will she be compensated on the day of her retrieval, or will it be a few weeks after her retrieval, and will she receive expenses for her lost wages, her travel, and her daycare expenses. So it's important that the parties understand that the contract makes clear that the donor is entitled to compensation for the medical risk that she's taking, and she's entitled to that regardless of the outcome. So for example, if the donor goes through this entire process and at the end of the day, no eggs are harvested, or let's say the eggs are retrieved but they all die, the donor will still be fully compensated. And this is because, again, we are not compensating the donor for her eggs. We're not buying and selling eggs. We are only compensating her for her medical process and the risk that she's taking. And so another big section, of course, is going to be liability and assumption of risk. It is very important to have the relief of liability language in your contract because this is an invasive procedure and of course there can be complications and the egg donor must understand that she is taking a risk, she's being compensated for that risk. As we discussed, it's not a risk-free process, 
there certainly can be complications, um, and there could be potentially complications years after the retrieval um, that could potentially be linked to the retrieval or perhaps the medication that the donor was taking. So the egg donor does need to understand those risks and she needs to understand that she will not come back years later and hold the recipient family liable. And so for many reasons, as you can see, it is very important that there is legal representation on both sides. There will need to be an attorney representing the egg donor and an attorney representing the recipient family. And the egg donor must have a full understanding as to the risk that she's taking and what the contract that she's signing. And again, um, I just want to review some um, important uh, items that we reviewed today. Uh, first screening is crucial in, um, you know, this includes screening for a surrogate as well as an ovum donor to ensure that intended parents are matched with the right surrogate to build their family. And I again welcome you to contact me to discuss screening in more detail because a lot of the cases that went wrong that you hear about were cases where screening was not well done and, or where parents locate their own surrogate online and don't do the necessary screening that a surrogacy program would do. And legal planning, of course, is also very important to ensure that the intended parent's parental rights are protected and that you know from the beginning how your parental rights will be finalized. And this is an issue for the surrogates as well because one of the surrogates' fears is that intended parents won't take the baby or will change their mind. You know, surrogates are surrogates uh, because they really want to help another family and they don't want to have any more children. So they want to make sure that intended parents at the end of the day are taking their babies. So again, the surrogate also wants to understand how the process will be finalized and that her name will not be on the birth certificate. And in all of these various reproductive law agreements, it is important that the donors and surrogates understand that which they are doing and what they are agreeing to. The intended parents need to understand their rights, all their legal issues surrounding their rights, their, um, and again, legal representation for both the surrogate and the intended parents is very important. So I welcome you to contact me for additional information, any questions that you may have or for professional references. You can reach me by email at ys at surrogatesteps.com or by phone at 607-273-3332. Our websites can also provide you with additional information and resources, so be sure to also visit us on the web at surrogatesteps.com or yslawgroup.com. And thank you again for joining us today. And we do have some time for some questions, and I have received some questions, I welcome you to send me questions to my email address, again, at ys.surrogatesteps.com, and I apologize in advance if time does not allow me to get to everyone's questions. I will still reply to your questions via email.